Okay, it's been a while since we've done a video, but I'm going to try to fill in a couple holes from the, the selection of videos that are out there. I'm really kind of looking forward to it, teaching the course again this January. It's been a few years, and, and so I wanted to, to see about doing that. So one of the areas that we haven't uh, created any videos on is dealing with uh, uh, trusses. Uh, so we're going to deal simply with planar trusses as an uh, introduction. Of course, a truss is a structure that uses uh, axially load-bearing members only, so all the ends of the members are all hinged so that they're not able to carry any other load other than an axial load. And uh, that means that the internal forces uh, align with the long longitudinal axis of the member, which gives us the geometry of the force components. Uh, so there are a couple unique uh, techniques as far as solving them. So we have a problem here. We have a planar truss. Uh, it uses typical 435 triangles, so we're going to benefit from that geometry. And we're going to use a couple different methods to solve it. The first method we're going to use is the method of sections. This is really useful when you know a very specific line of action, if you will, or a plane point on the, on the structure where you want to know the internal forces and you can go directly to solving it there. Later on, we'll use the method of joints. The method of joints is particularly useful if you want to solve the entirety of the internal forces in all of the members throughout the, uh, the truss. So the first step, one to remember, is you can't start looking at the internal forces until we get the external forces complete. Uh, to do that, we have to solve for the reactions. So I've gone ahead and I've drawn a, a free body diagram of the whole truss uh, out here. I've got the external forces, the one kilonewton and the five kilonewton drawn in. But what I need to do is I need to ha add the reaction forces in lieu of the supports at A and D. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So at A we have two components of force. We have a vertical and a horizontal because it's a pin. At D we have simply a vertical because of the roller. And then I'm going to label those. So we have reaction at A. I'll call that X. I'll label that up in a second. Reaction at A in the Y. Reaction at D in the Y. Better label my axes or somebody will get upset with me. Don't want to leave them implied. And then with everything labeled, the next step, of course, is just simply to take the uh, equations of static equilibrium to apply them to this free body diagram. And thus, we're able to solve for each of the three reactions. So we have three equations to choose from. Uh, it does make it more efficient if we choose them in a logical order. So the one that I typically start with is the sum of the moments about a particular point. And I try to, try to choose a point that eliminates at least two of the unknowns. So we can eliminate them by making sure that their perpendicular distance to the point about which we're going to rotate is equal to zero. So the point to do that in this particular truss is at point A because the reaction AX and the reaction AY both pass through point A, reducing their perpendicular distance to zero, and thus they eliminate them from the equation. So let's just set it up. Sum of the moments about point A equals zero. We'll set that up for uh, rotation about point A clockwise as positive. And then we go through and we choose each of the external forces, multiply them by their per perpendicular distance, assign a sense to them, positive or negative, depending on whether they tend to rotate the structure about point A clockwise or counterclockwise, and then solve for the unknown. So we'll start with the one kilonewton. It tends to ro ro rotate the structure counterclockwise, so we'll set it as negative. And its perpendicular distance is this vertical distance of four meters. Then we'll deal with the five kilonewtons. It goes in as positive as it tends to want to turn the structure clockwise about point A. So five kilonewtons with a perpendicular distance of the six meters, the distance between A and F. And finally we have RDY, again counterclockwise. So it goes in as negative multiplied by its perpendicular distance of 9 meters. From there we can solve R dy is equal to 2.889 kilonewtons. Now you see that has a, a probably an excessive number of significant digits, but what I'm going to try to do is to avoid truncation error as we go through uh, this system. Uh, which is 
I mean, trust problems are fraught with truncation errors, so you always end up with these mi minor inconsistencies as you go through. So by carrying multiple digits and then rounding off at the end to a reasonable number of significant figures, we kind of uh, avoid that numerical problem. So then I'm going to do some of the forces in the x direction. Equal to zero. So going through our structure, we start, we have R, A, X, which is in the positive direction. We subtract from that the one kilonewton, and that's all we have horizontally. So that really tells us that R, A, X is equal to one kilonewton. And we've drawn it in the right direction because we came up with a positive uh, value. And that leaves just some of the forces in the y direction. Set it equal to zero. We have RAY positive up. Going across, we have the five kilonewtons going down. So it's a negative plus reaction dy, which is positive going up. So we have a, a value for RDY, which is 2.8 eight, nine kilonewtons, and we can solve R A Y equal to 2.111 kilonewtons. And before we leave this, I'm just going to go back to the free body diagram and write in what those values are. So R D Y, we said was 2.889 kilonewtons, R A Y, 2.111 kilonewtons, and RAX was 1.0 kilonewtons. Now I put them in a different color and in brackets just to maintain the logic flow so that we know that those values were not known when we started that part of the problem. But I do want to record them there because when we go back and look at the free body diagram later, we want to know what the values are and not specifically the, the variables. Okay, so the next step is the actual method of sections. We've solved for all of our external forces, and now we're free to go ahead and solve for internal forces. So I'm going to do a method of sections, which is to say I'm going to do the truss, and I'm going to cut it through a particular plane, throw away all of one side of the plane or the other, and then replace what I've cut with internal forces along the uh, line of action of the various truss members, and then I can go ahead and solve it. So I'm gonna need to do a partial free body diagram. diagram. So let me set that up here. Okay, so uh, I've transferred the free body diagram uh, from the, uh, the other section. I've dropped it down here. Uh, so what I need to do is really pass a plane through the truss. So I'm gonna go a vertical plane from top to bottom, which is gonna cut through members B, C, B, F, and E, F. So we're going to do that here, and then I'm going to throw away all to the right-hand side and leave just the left-hand side. doesn't matter which side I do. They would both solve out to be the same. So I'm going to do that here. So it doesn't matter where between B and C we, we drop that plane. The extent, we know that the forces in those members are going to be applied longitudinally anywhere in that member. Uh, of course, it's convenient to us geometrically if we do it either uh, at BE or at CF. So I've chosen BE just to keep it simple. And now I'm just going to draw in my internal forces. Do that again. The force EF. And of course the force BF, which we know they all line up with the geometry of the members because they're acting axially along each of the members. And I'm just gonna go ahead and label those force BC, force BF, and force EF. And really what we see is using the partial free body diagram, a repeat of the application of the equations of static equilibrium to determine what the three internal forces are uh, in this case. Uh, one of the tricks, of course, to remember is that you know the orientation of all of the forces, including the one that's on an angle, because they do line up with the geometry of the problem. So I'm just going to set that up here. Again, I'm going to start with some of the moments. And in this case, I'm going to choose point B as my point of rotation, set it equal to zero. Again, I will set it up as clockwise being positive. 
And of course, the reason why I chose point B, like before, I have two of my unknowns, FBC and FBF, passing through point B. So their uh, perpendicular distances then go to zero, which leaves me one unknown in this particular equation. So let's uh, run it out then. So that's equal to RAY multiplied by its perpendicular distance of three meters. Uh, positive going clockwise about point B minus R A X trying to do it count or trying to rotate it counterclockwise about point B multiply by its perpendicular distance of four meters minus the force E F again going counterclockwise so a negative and a perpendicular distance of four meters now we'll substitute in for what our known values are. So we know RAY as 2.111 kilonewtons. And we know RAX as 1.0 kilonewtons. And that means we can solve for the force EF is equal to 0.5833 kilonewtons. Now I purposely drove drew all of my force, internal forces, to show a member in tension, which is to say that the member is pulling on the joint, which is to say the joint is pulling on the member, so I've drawn them in tension. So if I get a positive number, I know it's going to be in tension. In this case, I got a positive number, so I can also identify that that member is in tension. I'll do some of the forces in the y direction equal to zero equal to RAY minus, and in this case we have the component of FBF, which is vertical. So the component is lined up in the geometric relationship of, of the member uh, within BF, which is to say the vertical component, because the 4-5 triangle will be 4 fifths of the value FBF. And that's it. There's no other vertical forces. So again, we can solve directly for FBF is equal to 2.6388 kilonewtons. And again, it's positive. So we know it's going to be in tension. And then finally, some of the forces in the x direction equal to zero. So what do we have? We have RAX positive right. We have FBC positive right. And the horizontal component of FBF, so that will be in the ratio of 3 to 5. And finally we have FEF. And so we'll substitute it in for our knowns, Rex 2.111 kilonewtons, FBF 2.6388 kilonewtons, and FEF 0 0.5833 kilonewtons, which allow us to solve for FBC equal to negative 3.166 kilonewtons. Because it's negative, we know that it is in compression and that we have drawn the force in the wrong direction. And so that's it. We've actually solved this problem. We've been able to jump directly to the internal res resolution of the forces BC, BF, and EF using the method of sections after we solve for the external reactions. And that about sums it up. So we're going to clear the screen. We're going to come back and we're going to do the same problem, only we're going to use the method of joints and uh, carry that through to solve for all the problems or all the members uh, of the truss.